My video last week was all about the recent data dump and scientific publications that have come from the LOFAR collaboration. LOFAR is a radio telescope of thousands of antennas spread across 2,000 kilometers across Europe, and it's enabled us to see burps from black holes in 20 times more detail than we've ever seen before. Now, if you have seen that video, then you'll know that as part of it, I interviewed PhD student Fritz Weyen from the Leiden Observatory about his work on high redshift sources in LOFAR. Now, only five minutes of our chat actually made it into the final cut of that video, but we chatted for a lot longer. So here is the full interview that I did with Fritz Weyen, PhD student at Leiden Observatory. All right, Fritz, let's start off with what is your role in the LOFAR collaboration? My role so far has been as a PhD candidate, very exploratory for myself as well. So I came into this doing my master's project on the topic of radio astronomy as well. That was at, at higher frequencies, so at gigahertz frequencies. And then I saw this advertisement for the LOFAR telescope to go into high resolution imaging at megahertz frequencies, so very low radio frequencies, almost the lowest frequencies that reach the earth, in fact. And so I got very interested in that and took the position and then my role started to become helping test the existing pipelines that we had, help to develop them further, and just in general as an end goal to see how far we could push this telescope to really take the bottom of the bucket out of it and push it as far as we could go. A very attractive for me is that LOFAR is also, because of these techniques, it has a very technical aspect in terms of both computing and developing pipelines and stuff, which was very attractive for me as well, to not only see the science side of things, but also get your hands dirty and actually develop something that people might use in the future. So that, that's really cool then, that to know that not only have you sort of, you know, advanced human knowledge a little bit, but you've contributed to other people being able to do science as well right like the, the fact that you have this legacy almost now from your phd <laughs> yeah exactly and is it nice to be part i mean i know it is a huge collaboration is it isn't it um like a real international collaboration or at least europe across europe collaboration anyway like is it fun to be part of such a, a big group of people yeah yeah that's actually as you say it's it's such a big collaboration so it's not just a small group of people sitting in one institute but it really also spurs collaboration between different countries because it's the UK that's involved, Italy is involved, and France, and well, I, I can name like all the countries, <laughs> but there's just this huge network and it also helps just building up your own network because then it's more easy to see people from different universities. And so what did you specifically study then with this this new long baseline data from, from LOFAR that's given, you know, just these incredible resolutions? I studied one object in particular. It's uh, very boringly called 4C4315, <laughs> which uh, the number 4C indicates that it comes from a catalog of very bright radio sources. So these are very uh, relatively old catalogs already. They started with 3C and then 4C, 5C, 6C, and each one is stepping down in brightness a little bit. But so this is a very bright radio source. But what makes this one interesting is that it's very far away. So it's uh, what we call at a redshift of 2.4. And if you translate it to the age of the universe, then the universe was 2.6 billion years old only. Mm -hmm. So by studying this object, we have a chance to study both the early universe, but also a very young radio source in its early stages of its development. Mm -hmm. And there is a specific aspect of these sources that we wanted to study with this object, which is called the redshift spectral index correlation. And so what the spectral index basically tells you is how, how does the, the brightness of an object change as a function of frequency? So how does, it, how does it behave if we look at the different frequency? Does it get brighter or fainter? And it turns out that there is a relation between how it changes, so the slope of this change and the redshift so the distance that these objects are at. And it has long been known that objects that are further away tend to have a steeper slope. So we call these steep spectrum objects. Um, but the cause of that has been relatively unknown or, or under debate for a couple of decades. And now there is sort of a prevailing theory that it is about one thing, but then we wanted to use the LOFAR telescope to now probe with this object to see if we could confirm that theory was indeed correct. Nice. This object being at such high redshift, I mean, this is the kind of thing that with the normal resolutions of at least low frequency stuff, you wouldn't have had a hope <laughs> of seeing anything but a blob, right? Like what did, what did the end eventual image look like? Was it just a slightly more resolved blob or was it like a, 
moment, you know, where <laughs> you had all this detail. No, no, for it was exactly that moment because uh, so this one is big enough that that for normal low fire. So the Dutch stations we see two blobs, not one, but two blobs. Mm-hmm. But then indeed, uh, if you take all the international stations with it, then it turns out you know, into these beautiful pictures that we know from nearby galaxies. But all of a sudden, you can see this amazing detail in what we call the lobes of the galaxy. You can identify the core where the black hole is harbored. Mm. So there's much more detail all of a sudden revealed. And that was actually a crucial aspect of how to study this Z-alpha relation with this object. I was going to say, is that the main thing we learned from this this new resolution data then is, is the Z-alpha relation? Yeah, so one aspect that is crucial to study this relation is to be able to to probe very low rest frame frequencies, as we call them. So because it's mm-hmm. so far away, the emission gets redshifted, so wavelengths mm-hmm. get longer. And what it also means is that the the frequencies that you are actually probing with telescopes here on Earth, they shift from what they actually are. And so with the lowest frequencies, you really push this back to the lowest rest frame frequencies as well. And what we can then study is what is the initial spectrum of this source. Mm. Depending on how that initial spectrum then changes over time, we can uh, determine what happens. And so the the prevailing theory now was that it's actually a mixture of what we call spectral aging with a fancy term, which is the the electrons that are made in those lobes, they gyrate in the magnetic field of this galaxy and they radiate away their energy through synchrotron radiation. Mm. But what also happens is that the cosmic wave uh, cosmic microwave background can also interact with these electrons and drain energy from it that way. And so the idea is that because the universe is denser at higher redshifts and the early universe is more dense than the current universe, and also the CMB will also be more dense in terms of energy, that this happens more often and that it hence loses more energy to the CMB. That's so cool. I think that must be one of the things that's just so important for like studying high redshift sources, right? I mean, because I think a lot of people would be if given the choice, they'd be like, I want to study the, the beautiful, amazing, detailed, low redshift sources. And I know obviously you've gotten this incredible detail that you've never seen before with this source at higher redshift. But like, you know, this is almost how you have to convince people, right, to study high redshift stuff is, is from how much you can learn from it. Yes, indeed. And you need that connection because, of course, you can study the nearby objects in, in great detail, even at low frequencies, because even with poor resolution, you have, if the object is just right in your face, then, then you can still make out a lot of the detail that you want. But we really need to study it, um, the distant objects in the same relative detail in order to, to evolution, evolutionary connect them from the early universe to the current universe. Because if we can't disentangle this detail so far away, then all we can do with our models is guess how it works and then model it and see if something resembling the universe today comes out. Mm. By observing this directly with the LOFAR telescope, we can just directly test these models and see does it match what we measure in this source. Nice. And are you hoping to to push this to higher redshift to, to see if you can find in the low far data, maybe some more higher redshift sources? Yeah, yeah, certainly. There, there are already uh, higher redshift sources on the list of being studied for the same, uh, for the same reason. So nice. this one was actually uh, a part of a pilot sample, which was composed by Leia. So there were uh, actually mm-hmm. 10 sources on the list. And I started with this one to, uh, to get familiar with the long baseline data reduction process myself, mm-hmm. but there were more sources to be uh, intended to be studied for the same reason. Do you think, so you've got, I mean, you've got 10 on the list now. Like, how many do you think there actually is hiding in the, like, low far data of just the entire northern sky? Oh, I think there will be plenty. Like, I wouldn't dare quote an exact number. It depends on who you talk to, what high redshift actually means. So some people will say, like, oh, that's, that must be redshift five or higher, like the really exotic ones. But for us, it's already already enough if we can see these these redshift one or two and beyond sources in this new detail. And they're much more plentiful. Is that the hope, though, that, you know, to observe like the thousands of sources, if you can, to, to get almost just better statistics? Or is there, is there other stuff you can learn from, from observing more of them? Yeah, exactly. Because one of the problems that you have now is this is a single source. So we can say, OK, what we see here matches our current idea. So indeed, the calculations that we did do indicate that the CMB interaction is very important. And it, it has told us that... It's very likely that since this is such a bright source that this gives us a sort of upper limit 
and that actually for the fainter galaxies, the CMB losses are even more important. But it's just one object. And as much as astronomers like to do low number statistics, <laughs> preferably we, we like more. So indeed, there's definitely merit in observing as many of these sources as we can to do a more statistical, proper study mm. of what the process is going on in these galaxies actually are. So is that what the future holds for you, do you think? Um, or within, or do you think within the LOFAR collaboration, that's what will sort of be moving forward? Within the collaboration, definitely. Yeah. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm more uh, interested in other directions right now at the moment. But uh, <laughs> yeah. they, they are aligned, but my interests uh, are more towards the technical side of things now, mm -hmm. pushing the calibration forward and the imaging, that kind of thing. Nice. Yeah. So you'll probably definitely be able to talk then about how, I mean, it amazed me the fact that obviously the way that LOFAR does this is it doesn't, it, it records all the raw data and then you combine everything after the fact with the pipeline rather than combining at the observatory and then that's the data that's saved. So, the, I mean, the data transfer speeds that we're talking about here and just the data storage capabilities must be pushing the envelope so much of what is possible. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a very technical challenge because you have to imagine that because everything is... Uh... Well, what we call this correlating in, in radio uh, astronomical jargon. So you have the signal arriving at two telescopes, but there's a slight time difference between when it arrives. And then we, we compensate for the time difference and that you refer to as correlating the signal. But for LOFAR, that is done in real time. So what you have to imagine is the data from the Irish station and the data from the Polish station and the German station, they all have to arrive in Groningen timely enough that we can process this and real-time store the data. And the challenges are huge because uh, LOFAR typically does eight-hour observations and then you end up with a data set that's four to 16 terabytes in size. <laughs> and that's just wow. one observation and we do a couple thousand observations for the entire northern sky. Hmm. So do you think, I, I mean, when I think about LOFAR, I think of it as like the kind of thing when people say like, why, why bother doing astronomy and stuff like that and and you sort of say okay well eventually down the line the technology like trickles down to benefit society like you know digital cameras like ccds and and, and you know and things like wi-fi thanks to radio interferometry as well right it's just like stronger wi-fi do you think this will be the kind of thing that will like push forward that so much that eventually it's going to trickle down into to like society just like either better data storage, faster data transfer, either to and from sort of servers, that kind of thing? Like, are you guys kind of saying this needs to be better, like all the time to be able to do this? I think so, because if also as a country, like if you maybe want to join LOFAR, there's an incentive to just take your, your infrastructure and give it an upgrade. So it's also indeed a very big push on technology itself. So it's maybe not as direct as a CCD evolving into a camera in your phone, mm. but... It, it teaches us a lot on how to deal with big data, which is relevant in, in much more disciplines than just astronomy. Mm. And it teaches us on, on how to deal with extreme data streams in real time. Like, how do you deal with gigabytes per second coming into your system that you need to store or reduce? I can see why you've been wooed over maybe to the uh, the more technical side from the <laughs> science side. It's fair enough. But I think it's so important that you've worked with this data as well, though, right? Where you understand what people are trying to do with it. And so when you come to, to working on the technical side, you know, you've seen both sides of that. And I think that's so important when people are, you know, trying to put these things into, into motion and actually make them happen is understanding like what physically has to be the thing at the end for the science, right? Yeah. It must be so great to have had a PhD where you've got both of those insights. Yeah, yeah, that's very amazing. And as you say, it helps a lot because then if you know what a radio galaxy should look like, that will also help you with determining whether your calibration works, for example. Mm. And then also to be able to just advance knowledge is, is a very nice cherry on the cake that is also actually useful data. I mean, I guess the next big challenge is the SKA, right? The, the square kilometer array across South Africa and Australia. Do you think there'll be stuff that we've learned from LOFAR that, that goes into the into the SKA? I think so. I definitely think so. Because LOFAR was also part of the, the SKA pathfinders, as they are called. So they're they're almost like a, a small scale version, if you will, of the SKA. A pilot study. <laughs> a pilot study, indeed, yes. 
So they, they were actually intentionally made to see like, how do we deal with so much data? Because the data stream from the SKA, if I'm not mistaken, will be much bigger than that from LOFAR still. So a lot of that knowledge will undoubtedly find its way into, uh, into the SKA. Yeah. I mean, it's almost scary to think about it, right? In, in terms of the, the scalability of it, like how much bigger it is than LOFAR, how much more, it means so much more data. Like it's scary, but I'm glad there's people like yourself that's <laughs> behind all these projects that are making it happen, basically. Thank you so much to Fritz for taking the time to speak to me. I also spoke to Dr. Leah Morabito from Durham University who co-led the entire pipeline for LOFAR that makes this science possible. And you can check out uh, the chat that I did with her up here. And I'll also link it in the description down below. And I spoke to another PhD student, Shruti Badole, about her work on gravitationally lensed quasars too. And you can check out the interview with her again up here and I'll link it down in the video description below. I hope you've all enjoyed these chats with people from the LOFAR collaboration, seeing the people behind the science, behind the sort of the headlines, if you will. I know I love doing this sort of stuff. Um, so I hope you guys do too. If you wanna see more stuff like this, let me know down in the comments.